Well, good morning. We are about to start our worship service. We invite you to uh, prepare your heart. And we just want to welcome you and thank you for being with us today. This is Grace Bible Church, San Ynez Valley. And we are so thrilled to be able to gather together uh, via digital media to uh, bring the Word of God to your home, to bring worship to your home. And yet we long for that day when uh, these seats will be filled once again and corporately we will be able to worship the Lord. A couple of announcements we just bring to your attention at the very beginning this morning. Uh, one of those is our midweek prayer gathering, which will be this Wednesday night from uh, seven to eight for prayer. You can check in 15 minutes early. You can hang out about 15 minutes afterwards, just purely to talk and fellowship and, and see how each other is doing. And by the way, we have uh, shepherding teams and leaders that are making time during the week to call and connect with people who uh, may be isolated or just to check and see how you are doing. And we want to uh, let you know that if for some reason you haven't received a call or you have a particular need that is not being met, we would love for you to call the church. Um, you can call Pastor Blaine, you can call myself on uh, our cell phones if there's something we can do as a church body to help minister to you. We want to be able to do that. We also want to invite you to give us some feedback as we're thinking about ways to minister to our communities, uh, Lompoc, Santa Maria, San Inez Valley, even Goleta. Um, if, if there's ways that you can think of that we as a church body might be able to come together and minister to the people in our communities, we would love to do that. We are working on a, a prayer box right now that we'll have available at the church so people who are just concerned about things that are going on in the world, particularly with uh, COVID-19, um, can stop and, and drop off a prayer request and possibly we'd be able to contact them. Um, so we want you to know there are ways for us to minister to our people in the community, even if we can't be in close proximity to them. There are needs that are still out there and uh, ways that we can meet those needs. Well, I want to invite you to turn with me to God's Word. We're in Psalm 119 this morning. We're going to pick up and continue uh, where we left off um, earlier. This morning we are going to read verses 49 to 56. Uh, the psalmist David writes, Remember the word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your word has revived me. The arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I have remembered your ordinances from of old, O Lord, and comfort myself. Burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. But your statutes are my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. O Lord, I remember your name in the night and keep your law. This has become mine, that I observe your precepts. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Father God, as we look to your word this morning and as we gather together corporately as the body of Christ, though we are disparate from one another, yet Lord, we are one in purpose. We are one in the spirit. Lord, our longing is to hear from you. And so Father, we come with our praise. We come with our worship. We come with our adoration of the one who loves us more than we will ever know, the one who sent his son to Calvary, the son who willingly carried out the Father's will to go to the cross, to take upon himself all of the afflictions that would rightfully belong to us and save us for himself and save us for his kingdom. Lord, to you we give the praise, to you we give our thanks. And Lord, we are thankful as well for the word of God. As the psalmist has reiterated again and again, even in these few verses, your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, your word. Father, may all of these resonate in our hearts. May we long to know your word and to hear from you through the word of God that we might know how to live pleasing to you. Father, be with us now as we come before you with our singing, 
as we bring to you our worship. And Father, as we hear the word of God faithfully and clearly proclaimed from this pulpit today, Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bible Church. Isn't our God awesome? Amen. He is so awesome. We're going to sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and He really is just that. He is a shoulder that we might lean on, that He might help us through whatever hard times that we are going through, because no matter how hard it may seem to us, it's nothing for Him.
is Lord, I lift your name on high. settled here, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 27, and if you had the opportunity to print out from an email that I sent to you the outline for Psalm 27, it will help you as, as I go along. Before I read the, the text for this morning, I want to introduce it briefly. I received um, an email from a man of, who is very involved in missions regarding a newsletter in the area of Iraq, or from the area of Iraq. Quote, I was in Iraq during the ISIS occupation. While visiting families that had lost everything and were living in tents, I witnessed incredible joy. I asked one of the refugee camp leaders why they were so joyful. He said, before ISIS, we were Christians. Now we know Christ. Well, I mean, does that include everybody in the group as the leader is talking about? Or were there some who knew Christ already, but they just weren't experiencing their first love? While in Iraq, before all of the crises developed, they were hanging on to the security of their families, their neighbors, their homes, and whatever else provided them with some stability. But when ISIS came in, and when the wars came in, and when they were transferred to a refugee camp, they had very little in comparison. And so they were focused on Jesus Christ. That's a good message for us here in this country, is it not? While we may be isolated in our homes, we're stopped in our refrigerators, we have all kinds of communication going on, even this live stream is taking place, where it couldn't take place in many uh, sections of the world because of what COVID has brought to the planet. And it's a time for us to take our eyes off of the things of the world and to focus on 
Jesus Christ, and David's psalm is going to enable us to do that. But again, though, before I go into the psalm, I want to project a picture here. Perhaps we have it. Yes, we do. And as you look at the picture, you can see these four containers. You may not readily see them, but there's a container that's upside down, a container that's right side up and is filled, one that's on its side, and one that is not only filled, but larger. And so, if you can picture in your mind's eye water coming down from a living fountain, that living fountain being God, with those who have not yet been saved, their vessel, their being, is like that first container. It's upside down. They're unable to receive the spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ that God has for those who are his children. But in the second container, albeit it's smaller than the fourth, it's turned upright. That's salvation. We are regenerated. We are made alive in Christ. And God is showering as a living fountain blessings upon us. And we experience our first love. And then there are times where we fall into transgression, into sin, and we're grieving the Holy Spirit, and He's warning us, but we're not, we're not repenting right away. While we're receiving ministry from the Holy Spirit, conviction and grieving and turn back, this is not the way to go, you're not going to be happy. In a sense, our cup is turned sideways, we're still saved, we can't lose our salvation, but we're not getting the same positive um, experience of the ministries of the Holy Spirit that were ours prior to our falling back. And then picture this larger vessel, it's receiving and overflowing the, the fountain of living water from God. And that is a picture not only of being spirit-filled, but in contrast to the second uh, container, it, it is a picture of us growing in our faith. And we read in Ephesians 3, verse 19, I'm kind of picking up the very end of Paul's prayer there to Ephesus, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So picture those vessels. As God progressively increases the size of our heart, we're able to take in more and more of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We grow progressively. And that's the goal. And in Psalm 27, you're, you're dealing with the man who had those experiences where he fell into transgression. But you're also dealing with a man who was restored mercifully time and time again. A man who faced tremendous danger, who is in tremendous danger in Psalm 27 but who has a deeply laden, anchored confidence in God. And I would say his, his cup is upright. It's bigger than it used to be. He's receiving the showers of blessings from God. But he is afraid. He is worried. And so he is fortifying his faith in Psalm 27 because it's, it needs to be fortified. Let me read the psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock, 
and now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Here he is right in the midst of this dangerous situation, worshiping God. Verse 7 is a transitional verse. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me, and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me. O God of my salvation, verse 10, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. 12 is a transitional verse. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my enemies, for false witnesses have risen against me. Actually, it's 13 that is the transition. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Now, David is giving to us, as I interpret the passage, three ways to fortify our faith. The first one, found in verses 1 through 6, is talk to yourself, or to you, about Him. Remind yourself about Him. The second one is, having done so, now talk to Him about you, about your situation. And then thirdly, in the last two verses, wait on Him to fortify you. Having reminded yourself of His beauty, having then gone to prayer, you wait for God to answer prayer. Well, let's look at this first point. Talk to you about Him, verses 1 through 6. Now, many of us went through, a year and a half ago or so, maybe it was last year, <laughs> um, Paul Tripp's book on suffering. And he, along with others, good teachers on the internet, have said together, no one talks to you more than you. As we go through the day, where our thoughts are communicating to ourselves all the time, would that they were garnered by the Word and by the Holy Spirit, but we talk, either negative or positive things. And in verses 1 through 6, essentially, for the major part, David is reminding himself, he is talking to himself about his God, how wonderful and powerful and available God's resources are. He's actually fortifying his faith by preaching to himself of God's power and goodness in his life in the past. And then he reminds himself of specific events in the past. That's verses 1 through 6. So the application we want to make here in verses 1 through 6, including the last two verses, 13 and 14, is we need to talk to ourselves about Him. Well, what does David say about himself in this terrible predicament where enemies are encamped around him, ready to devour his flesh like ravenous wolves? Well, verse 1, from the Lord, the Lord is my light. And my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life, whom shall I dread? Now the way that verse 1 is structured, light and, and salvation are linked together, and then secondarily to defense. So we're going to look at those three principles briefly about God. God is, in His essential being, light. God is in the essence of who he is, is a saving God. Whether that's saving David out of this difficulty or bringing salvation to the lost. And then God defends his children in every situation, even in situations where they end up having to die. Talk to yourself. 
during the day that God is your light and your salvation. Spurgeon said, with respect to these three aspects of God, David, in his extreme difficulty, was held by a threefold cord which cannot be broken by any person. When it says that God is David's light and salvation, can you say that? If you know the Lord, you can say that. Light and salvation go hand in hand. They can't be separated. That salvation, the light of God's holiness, His holy loving mercy, penetrates your hearts and removes the veils that blind you from seeing the beauty of the Lord. God's own being indwelling within you now, causing your hearts to know and to feel His saving, tender, merciful, personal affection and kindness for you at salvation. So talk to yourself about the wonder of salvation, the opening of your eyes, the removal of the veil that otherwise prevented you from seeing how beautiful God is in His salvation. But also talk to yourself about God as your defense. When things aren't going well, perhaps you're feeling lonely during this isolationism. Perhaps you're feeling prevented from ministering the way you otherwise were ministering to the lost. Well, you're missing the fellowship that we have. Albeit we have that on the, on the internet, but it's not the same, I've heard, from many, as being together, right? There's nothing like being together as a as a loving church family, as we support each other. But God is your defense. He personally, in His being, defends you. He is an all-powerful keeper. Reminds us of Psalm 121. He is the keeper of our souls. Even in the greatest turmoil we could ever experience now or in the future to come. Psalm 121 Verse 7, He protects you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Well, if you've noticed in, in this passage in verse 1, he asks two questions, David does. Who should I fear? Or who should I dread? The answer is, obviously, the questions give their own answer by who God is. No one. Given that God is my light and my salvation and my personal defense, I will fear no one or no third circumstance. That's the benefit of talking to yourself, fortifying your faith with the blessings of Scripture. In verse 2 we read, When evildoers came upon me. So David is still talking to himself, but he's reminding himself that God is his light. God is his Salvation. God is his defense. That's what he's doing. When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. He remembers that from the past. And he's entrusting God to do it in the present. Verse 3. Though a host in camp against me, my heart will not fear. The war arise against me. In spite of this, I shall be confident. That's Psalm 27, verse 3. I don't know what it's like to be a soldier. I don't know what it's like to be surrounded by enemies that are ravenous. David knew that many, many times in his life. I've read of soldiers in the encampments, whether that's World War II or World War I or Civil War. There can be amongst the soldiers a fluttering in the heart of fear because you're anticipating the imminent battle. And he's speaking, the, the war arise against me after the encampment. I'm confident. In spite of that, I'm confident. And where is this confident found? in his ability, despite the difficulties 
to set the difficulties aside and to focus on God, to meditate on God, to talk to himself about who his God is, to fortify his soul with good soul preaching. Talk to yourself about God in difficult circumstances and you'll find your faith fortified. In spite of this, I will be confident. Verse 4. One thing. Now mind you, can you imagine? I don't know how many things would be on my mind if I were in David's situation right here. But he's got one thing on his mind. One priority. Kind of reminds me of Paul in Philippians 3. This one thing I do. I press on to know Christ. One thing I have asked from the Lord that, look at the emphasis here, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. I think this is the key to David's own self-meditation on the being of God. Not only because it refers to his beauty, not only because he says it's his priority, but then he says, I'm going to seek it. I may be in a very adverse situation out in the fields. I may have my mighty men around me, but I'm not finding that their faith and their, I'm not finding my confidence in other people, no matter how strong they are in Jesus Christ. I'm glad they're here with me. I look to God and I meditate on Him. And specifically, I focus on His beauty. What would His beauty be? Well, if you look at a sunbeam through a rainbow, an arc, you've got all that stuff taking place, whatever it is, refraction, um, deflection, reflection, I don't know, it's way beyond me. But I see in the rainbow all the colors of the rainbow, but I don't say, look at the colors, I say, look at the beautiful rainbow as a whole. And so beauty captures all of God's wonderful attributes, including the fact that He is light, salvation, and defense, but you can include gentleness, He is your comfort, He is your mercy, He is your enabling grace, He is faithful. It go, the list goes on and on. That's the beauty of God. He's going to do what? He's going to meditate on God, and He's going to focus on how beautiful His God is. The word meditation is all over Scripture. I could get lost in that word alone, especially in the Old Testament. I'll give you just a couple of verses. Psalm 145, verse 5. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. I will turn over and over and over again in my mind gleaning from your testimonies all of the nutrients for my soul to build it up, to fortify it in my present situation. I will meditate. Psalm 119, verses 97 through 100. Some say David wrote this. Some say Ezra wrote this. I'm not really sure who wrote it, but anyway, it's wonderful. It's applicable to David right now. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation. How often? All the day. Verse 98, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. Twice meditation in this passage is emphasized. Meditation, this is a, my definition, it's not necessarily perfect, but it, in this context especially, it is David's absorbed thought process that's fixed on the beauty of God in all of the penelope of his amazing, glorious attributes. The ability to spite everything that's going on around him, to have a strong thought life garnered by the power of the Holy Spirit, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, 
the very word of God fueling his thought life so that he is being emptied of himself as he's being swallowed up in God himself in preparation for things to come for him, which are difficult. Spurgeon writes about meditation. And mind you, Spurgeon was an incredible reader. People were sending books to him from all over the world, asking him to endorse books. He knew the Old, he knew the New Testament, substantially. And this is what he has to say. Some people like to read so many chapters every day. I would not dissuade them from pra that practice. People that read through the Bible, he would never discourage that. But referring to his own palate, his own spiritual palate, he says, but I would rather let my soul soak, soak, marinate, in a half dozen verses all day, then rinse my hand in several chapters. Oh, to be bathed in a text of Scripture and to let it be sucked up into your very soul till it saturates your heart. Set your heart upon God's Word, exclamation point, he says. Let your whole nature be plunged into it as a cloth into a dye. Meditating on the beauty of God. Verses 5 and 6. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. So in warfare, his mind will still be, as it were, in the house of God, focused on the beauty of God, even though, even though he may have tools of weaponry in his hands, a shield and a sword. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle, in the secret place of his tent, he will hide me, he will lift me up on a rock, and now my head will be lifted up above my enemies. A God-centered thought life secures the soul no matter what the difficulty, and this difficulty is extreme. In the day of trouble, he will conceal you as you meditate on him. He will hide you in his own secret place of him. He will hide David. David's soul will be lifted up on a rock. His head will be lifted up above the enemies around him. Psalm, Psalm 32, verse 7. Verses, well, let me just read it. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance, Selah. David's heart now is experiencing an anticipation of the battle to come, what's going to happen as a result of his meditation. You read the end of verse 6. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Well, that's the first point to fortifying your faith, and that is talk to you about him augmenting or fortifying what you're saying to yourself by meditating on who God is and using the Word of God to help you in the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Now, in verses 7 through 12, we see David talking to God about himself. Verses 7 and 8, we read, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me, and answer me. Well, you know from hearing that, just read once, how emphatic that is. Hear. Cry. Be gracious. Answer. So though he's strong in his faith, what's around him is so serious, it's so difficult, that he acknowledges that his strength is found not in self, but in the perfecting grace of his God, and he's asking God to be gracious to him and to answer what he is now crying out for God to hear. He's crying out to God. He's saying, please answer me. 
I need your answer right now. I need to see your beauty. I need to experience your light. I need to experience my salvation, the joy of my salvation. I need to experience the surround sound of your deliverance in my heart. Because though I know my heart is fixed on you, I am weak and frail, and I feel as if I'm falling apart at the seams of my soul. And I want to tell you about me. I'm in peril. But in A, we see the emphasis on what he's praying for, which is linked to verse 4 and all of verses 1 through 6 in his meditation. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. The face of God. It's the same thing as seeing the beauty of God. It's the same thing as meditating and receiving a new, fresh awareness of God's immediate, defending, tender, affectionate, saving presence in your heart. It's being filled with the Spirit of God, with the Word of Christ richly dwelling within you, and you knowing the strength that's found in the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the joy that's found, the strength that's found in that joy. Nehemiah 8, Galatians 5, it's around verse 22. Lord, you know when you asked me to seek your face, that's precisely what I did. So now, dear Lord, verse 9, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. I mean, you're holy and I am sinful. I, I get that. I understand what I deserve. But I have salvation in the blood of a divine sacrifice for me. Don't hide your face. Don't turn away because I'm sinful and you're so utterly holy. Having seen you, I see my own sinfulness and I see your transcendent glory. What a contrast. Don't abandon me, nor forsake me. Oh God of my salvation, I need to see your face. Don't turn it away from me. I'm feeling weak, I'm unsteady. I feel like my knees are about to shake. I need you. Please answer. And by the way, Lord, answer fast. Verse 10. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, for the Lord will take me up. You know, this is not the, the, the main thrust of this sermon, but I heard um, Abner Chow from Grace Community Church actually look at this first, to try to encourage people on the internet. Uh, he's a professor at Master's College, a well-respected one at that. He said, you could look at verse 10 right now in your isolationalism. Some of you are just by yourself. Maybe you're by yourself with children. And you're lonely. And it's getting hard because it's been a long time. When will we reassemble? When will everything turn, return to normal? I don't know. You don't know. But here David's talking about a very painful thing. Lord, I'm reminding you that my mother forsook me, my father forsook me, but I know that you're going to take me up and answer to my prayer. Kind of echoing what he said about God in verses 5 and 6. Verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path. The implication is that David doesn't feel like he's standing firmly on solid soil, like he's slipping down despite everything else preceding this in Psalm 27, with worry and concern over the strength and the number of those ravenous enemies that have encamped around him. Lead me on a level path because of my foes. Do not, do not deliver me over to the desire of my enemies. Lord, you know they would tear me apart limb by limb. 
They are evildoers. They are wicked men. And by the way, as another aside, if, if you have people in your life who are dead set against you, constantly contradicting everything you say, thinking the worst of you, and it's actually because of Jesus in you, and maybe in addition to what you shared with them about the gospel of Jesus Christ, their animosity, their hatred towards you is better than their affection. Be encouraged about that. But David is talking about adversaries that are speaking falsely about him. That is so difficult. Why are they out of their mouths saying awful things to him in verse 12? Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. There's the reason. And such as breathe out violence. It's called personal animosity towards you that will not probably go away until in response to your prevailing prayers, they come to know Jesus Christ, and I've known that to take 20 to 25 years with immediate family members. You can share that experience, I know. If you know the Lord and are sharing your faith and praying for the lost, you know what it's like to lose their affection and to gain their animosity. Well, their animosity is better than, than their affection. Remember that. Well, we've looked at the first two points. The first one in verses 1 through 6 is David is talking to himself, preaching to himself. The one who talks to David more than anybody else is David. But he's fortifying his soul by telling himself about God's attributes. He's meditating on God's attributes. He's got focus. This is one thing I do. I focus on the face of God. Now I've asked God, Lord, you know, I want to know your face. I want to experience in a fresh way your face because when you invited me to seek your face, I responded, your face, face, I shall seek! Exclamation point. So the first way to fortify your faith is tell yourself about God. The second way is now with prayers that have been fueled by a meditating thought life set on fire, then pray accordingly. Verses 6 through 12. Lord, I want to tell you about me. But the bottom line here is, I'm not so much focused on my difficulty, and he is, it's, but it's, it's not primary in his prayer. What's primary in his prayer? First thing, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, or O Yahweh, that's a whole other lesson, but I shall seek. Don't hide your face from me. That's the emphasis here, and it corresponds to verses 1 through 6. So preach to yourself, and then call upon him, ask you, asking him in his grace to perfect you in your weakness in the present situation you find yourself in or will you find yourself in, in the future? And then thirdly, wait now. You know, Psalm 5 in the morning, I ordered my prayers and eagerly watched. Um, Spurgeon said, well, if you have done that in faith, and you have shot those prayers up to the Lord in faith, it's like arrows going straight up into the sky. You better keep looking for answers to those prayers, because the arrow may strike you right between the skull. So, that's what he's doing in verses 13 and 14. He's waiting for God to fortify him. Verse 13 gives us a real echocardiogram spiritually of what David is thinking. I would have despaired unless I had believed. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What is the land of the living, where you see the full goodness of God progressively throughout all of eternity? It is the heavenly land. Without hope in, of heaven, without the hope of being with 
the family of God in heaven? Without the hope of being with God after you die, David would have what done what? He would have lost it. Despair is the opposite of hope. I know what despair is like. But hope, hope is wonderful. Verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Waiting on God is everywhere in Scripture. Just everywhere. And here he has the hope to know that God is going to come personally alongside him before the battle, or in the battle, to fortify him. He's not going to despair. He has faith. And so he's calling upon God. He's confessing, God, if I didn't know I was going to be with you, if I was going to go into a battle and, and die and not think that you would take me right into your presence, I would have despaired. No matter what happens to us, even if COVID was 10 times worse in our area than it is, and you get to a point where you are infected with this virus, whether you're old or young, but more likely if you're old with pre-existing conditions, but it can happen to the young, we know that. The whole thought of a hospitalization, ventilation, even in that situation, this verse is for you. You will not be left if you know Jesus Christ on that ventilator and then put into the ground or cremated. No, your soul will be taken up in the land of the living with God and his people for eternity. And progressively, the beauty of the Lord will continuously awe you because he's infinitely beauty, infinitely beautiful. And when we get there, we're glorified, yes, but we're finite. So our awe of God is just going to get progressively greater and greater. The, the awe is always going to increase. I don't know what is there. Are there epics in heaven? I don't know. But you're going to just increasingly enjoy your God in heaven. So keep that in mind in difficulties, even in the worst outcome situations that you could imagine in your mind's eye when you're not doing well emotionally with respect to COVID. Keep that in perspective. There is this hope that enables you to tell yourself, I'm going to wait for Yahweh. Yes, I'm going to wait for Yahweh, twice said. Verse 14. And what am I going to wait for? Well, a lot. But specifically, he's limited, verse 14, to God's strength and God's courage. God's strength and God's courage. Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Verse 30. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, Yet, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. There is no guarantee that everyone from the churches in the San Inez Valley or in Los Alamos, Los Olivos, Lompoc, Goleta, is going to make it through COVID alive. There's no guarantee. But if you're afraid of death, you need to focus on the end of Psalm 27, actually on the whole 14 verses of Psalm 27. You need to fortify your faith, talking to yourself about His glory, praying to Him about how you feel, pouring out your heart before Him, 
I was going to read earlier Psalm 62, verses 7 through 8. Let me read it now. Oh God, of my salvation, or on God, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of strength, of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times. Oh people, pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Well, before I close, I want to take it to the worst case scenario because David is in a very bad situation and the application should be in the worst case scenario. I'm applying it to myself just in case something happens and I die. I have a backup plan. Actually, it's my, my upfront plan and so do you. I will safeguard myself as best as possible, but if I get COVID and don't do well, I have a backup plan, which is actually my number one agenda up in front of me. If my safeguards don't work, I have a steadfast hope that I wait for from God, through the Spirit, through the Word of God, and that is, it is better to be with the Lord than to be here. And I believe that with all of my heart, even though at times, I grow faint and weary like David was here. And I'm not, David was a man after God's own heart. Yeah, he stumbled, but God, man, get, God transformed this, this, this man's heart. Why do we have so much written by King David? He also wrote Psalm 23. I'm going to close with this in a short illustration. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness. Surely goodness. This is hope. This is courage. This is strength from God. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Confidence in God, despite a war that could kill him. Well, I remember ministering to the sister of Janice Collier, Charlene Hutchinson, married for a long time to her husband in one home. And she was beginning to get too old to drive, and so I had to begin to minister and actually take steps to have her license removed from her. I went through with her children, particularly her oldest son, who helped me. And she gave up the car, and she found joy afterwards. And then it got to a place where she had to give up her home. And Charlene went into the Friendship House, and she was in one of those independent apartment areas, and then she was shifted, because she was getting closer to death, into one of the main assisted facilities there at the Friendship House over here in San Ignacio Solomon. And I'd go and see her, and she would always encourage me and cry. She always had the Bible going, or reading the Bible, or something on TV that had something to do with the Lord. And this was, I think, I could be wrong on this, New Year's Eve. It may, I may be wrong. Janice, you can correct me. <laughs> but I thought it was New Year's Eve and she was going to die the next day. I went to see her. She had lost her license. She, well, she had lost her husband prior to that. She had lost her license. She had lost the home in which they raised their own kids. She had lost her independence and now she's dying. And she's filled with radiant joy, singing the praises of excitement about the fact that she's about to see Jesus. And it was an amazing experience for me. Here's personal revival right in front of me. And the next day she died, and I heard that Janice experienced the same thing after she visited her sister later than I. Charlene was an illustration of Psalm 27 for me. I dedicate Psalm 27 to my beloved sister, who I'm going to see in heaven, Charlene Hutchinson. Well, thank you.
Pastor Blaine, for that message on fortifying our faith. And during this time when so many people are fearful, so many are wondering what's happening and when will we be able to go back out, when will the world get normal. Uh, what a powerful reminder for us that our hope doesn't lie in the circumstances, but rather in knowing Christ. And most of you who are watching this um, have a faith in Christ. You need that faith fortified. You, you need that, um, that daily vitamin that builds up your immune system spiritually. But there may be some of you today who are watching and you don't yet have that faith in Christ. And so for you, you're still wondering, is this hope that Pastor Blaine spoke about this morning, is this hope something I personally can have? And what a wonderful conclusion to this message to share the testimony of a saint who, even though everything was taken away from her, and then ultimately everything will be taken from every one of us, that there is confidence and hope that goes far beyond the things of this world, and that hope and that faith is in Jesus Christ. If you're watching today and you don't yet have a relationship with Christ, I want to invite you to cry out to the Lord like David did, to cry out to him and say that one thing will I do, I will seek the face of the Lord. And that means confessing your sin, repenting of that sin, and then receiving the gift of God's grace by simple childlike faith. You can do that today in the quietness of your own home. You can do that today with a friend receive the gift of salvation that comes through Christ. That's our prayer for you today. Thanks for joining us at Grace Bible Church. Let me close our time in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for this powerful message on fortifying our faith. And it is only because we serve and love a sovereign, gracious God that we have a faith that is confident, not because of what we believe, but because of the one in whom we believe. Lord, we pray that you would indeed fortify our, our faith as we seek you day by day. And Lord, that if there are any listening this morning that have not yet come to faith in Christ, that today would be the day that they reach out and receive the gift of your grace by faith. Lord, we thank you for this day. In Christ's name, amen.